High and low efficacy therapies for SPMS, um, I really define in the same way that I define them for relapsing multiple sclerosis. Um, those terms, high and low efficacy, uh, correspond to how effective these therapies are at preventing inflammatory disease activity by the traditional measures we use, um, which are clinical relapses um, and uh, new uh, lesions forming on MRI. Um, in the context of uh, the, the paper we're discussing here, um, uh, they have divided those roughly based on uh, a low category, kind of the, the platform injectables um, that roughly have a, about a 30%, um, uh, lead to a 30% uh, decrease in rate of relapse uh, compared to a high efficacy group um, that is above 60% uh, in terms of its, um, its decrease on annual relapse rate. A very important question um, in uh, progressive MS in particular um, is whether traditional disease modifying therapies um, are effective even in people who don't have superimposed inflammation. Um, so these terms active and inactive MS uh, really correspond to when you say active, you're talking about the inflammatory aspect. So traditionally, um, we define progressive MS just based on someone's clinical course. If their disability was progressively worsening and they didn't have any um, clinical uh, relapses on top of that, um, you would call that um, a progressive MS um, and you wouldn't differentiate any further. Um, now we understand that the people who have active inflammation, meaning they have superimposed relapses or they're forming new lesions on their MRI, um, behave differently and, and potentially respond differently to our current therapies than, than those who are experiencing disability without superimposed inflammation because the mechanisms of disease are, are different. Um, and so the purpose of this study and similar studies was um, to ask whether our currently existing disease modifying therapies have the same effects uh, on people with secondary progressive MS who have superimposed inflammation, that's the active group, um, versus those who are experiencing progressive disability without traditional measures of inflammation. Um, and so it's a very important question in terms of, uh, of um, designing, the, uh, of coming up with the best treatment for patients. So what this particular study found um, uh, is that um, high efficacy therapies were better at preventing relapses and new lesions than low efficacy therapies, um, which is, is not surprising. Um, that's exactly what we see in, in relapsing MS populations. Um, the other finding was that there was no difference um, between the high efficacy and low efficacy therapies uh, on disability progression um, in these patients. What was, what was interesting about that um, is that they, they did differentiate between active and inactive patients. Um, and even among the active group in this study, they didn't find a, a difference in disability, whether you're talking about high efficacy and low efficacy therapies. Um, that particular finding, I, I think, um, uh, should be validated in, in different cohorts because I, I think based on prior studies and, and what we know about active um, MS, um, uh, you would expect that in certain patient populations, particularly those that, that have highly active um, MS, that, that high efficacy therapies would make a difference. Um, we, we do know from prior studies that um, for people with active secondary progressive MS, being on a disease-modifying therapy does impact disability versus not being on one. Um, they simply took it the next step and said, uh, um, can we see a difference between high efficacy and low efficacy therapies? Um, so to, to summarize, they showed that, uh, or they, they found that uh, disease modifying therapies, the higher efficacy therapies are better at preventing new inflammation, new inflammatory activity, which we would expect. Um, uh, there was not a difference in, in long-term disability. Um, uh, and that's particularly important for the inactive secondary progressive MS group. Um, uh, and uh, is, uh, is important for guiding the care of patients. The primary way that I relate this finding to my own practice is that um, in patients who are experiencing 
progressive disability without active inflammatory disease, um, it, it tells me that, uh, that current disease modifying therapies do not impact that process. Um, and uh, uh, kind of furthermore, that putting someone on what we consider a highly active therapy is not going to provide them additional benefit. Um, this is a, a very important point in my view. Um, I see a lot of patients uh, referred to my clinic who had been followed uh, in other neurology clinics uh, who had been escalated to high efficacy therapies because of uh, progressive disability, um, even without any new relapses or new MRI lesions. Um, and and this, is, this study provides further support um, that the, the mechanisms involved in progression in inactive secondary progressive MS are just different. Um, they're not targeted by our current disease modifying therapies. And so for a lot of these patients who are older, for whom the risk of these therapies is higher, um, we, we know that, that the, the benefit is not there. Uh, and so the risk benefit analysis just does not favor putting inactive secondary progressive MS patients on highly uh, efficacious disease modifying therapies. 